Okay. Hey. Welcome everyone to our special budget meeting. Um, it's wonderful to have you all here and those of us, oh, those of you who are joining us remotely. Um, before we move any further, the Greater Victoria School Board wishes to recognize and acknowledge the Songhees and Esquimalt nations upon whose traditional territories we live, we learn, and we do our work. And uh, boy, we're looking at a stretch of sunny days out there on these territories where it is just so beautiful. I feel so grateful. I'm looking forward to spending some time out there in the sun. Um, I hope all of you are finding ways to find rest and relaxation and connection to the lands over these very challenging times. Um, we've got a very busy um, agenda tonight with lots of presenters that I'm really looking forward to hearing. Um, and so without further ado, I'm looking for an approval of our agenda. Thank you, Trustee Leonard. Is there a seconder? Thank you, Trustee Ferris. I'm trying to get all my trustees on the same page here. All those in favor? Hey, that looks, you know, Trustee McNally, you're the only one I didn't see indicate. I'm sorry. Are you voting in favor? Trustee McNally? Can you see me, Chair? I was trying to. Uh, I think you might have been frozen. I indicate by a head shake. No, I'm not voting in favor. Okay. Uh, all those opposed? abstentions okay so the motion carries okay we have six presenters this evening thank you to all of you for giving up this glorious sunny evening to come and share your perspective and concerns with us um, each of you will have five minutes uh, to present and um, um, I will let you know when you get to the end of that time and just ask you to wrap up. It's always a little more awkward with uh, Zoom. So I will, I'll do my best to interject without ruining your flow. And hopefully we can just keep it as tight as possible. So everybody gets the same opportunity to, to speak. Um, so our first speaker is Cheryl McKinnon. Cheryl, I'm looking for you. You must be on my other page. I'm right there. Sure. Sorry. There you are. Can Cher, if I can just interrupt, can somebody let Trustee Duncan into the room? That's done. Thank you. Okay, I apologize, Ms. McKinnon. Um, please take it away and thank you again for joining us. Um, hello, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Cheryl McKinnon. Um, I'm a parent here in SD61. Uh, my oldest, Marcus, is uh, graduating from Reynolds in June, and my daughter is currently in grade eight at Cedar Hill Middle School. I wanted to speak um, to the proposed cuts to music, and I wanted to share with you the importance of music in my family's life. Uh, specifically, I wanted to share my oldest story. From the time Marcus was talking, they were singing. They were at their happiest in an assembly, in front of a packed gym dancing and bopping along to a song. You all know that kid, the one that everyone notices in an assembly? Yep, that was Marcus in elementary school. Now Marcus looked happy and full of joy, but the reality is that years of bullying at school helped create a very anxious, depressed, and ultimately suicidal individual. Marcus has since been diagnosed with generalized anxiety, depression, OCD, and PTSD, but I'm jumping ahead. When Marcus entered Cedar Hill, we encouraged them to try new things, explore new worlds, and they did, right into the music and band room. There they were exposed to a new world, a world of concert band, jazz band, show choir, concert choir, and vocal jazz. And I watched this extremely anxious kid settle into school to find a purpose to being at school. They found a place that they belonged. There were new friends, a place free of bullying, a place they were free to be who they truly were. 
a place where their self-confidence grew in leaps and bounds. I hadn't thought it was possible for this child to absorb more music than they had in elementary, but boy, was I wrong. At concerts, I would often have parents and teachers alike come and tell me, I love watching Marcus perform. They perform with their entire body. And you know what? They're right. Marcus performs with their body, their heart, their mind, and their soul. Very few people were aware of the struggles that were contained within that joyous shell. Because when they walked into a music room, a switch turned on. Their worries got left at the door. There's no room for anything else when music fills your soul this way. During Marcus's time at Cedar Hill, and ultimately at Reynolds, that anxiety turned to depression. The depression to suicidal thoughts and multiple attempts. Visits to the ER at BGH were multiple and frequent, including stays at the pediatric psychiatric unit. One year, Marcus spent over 10 weeks as an inpatient on various units. And each time there was one constant that would help Marcus battle those inner struggles, music. Once Marcus knew there was pianos on site, they were more motivated to work with the counselors to get to the point where they could go and they could visit those pianos. And let me tell you, I know where every piano at BGH is because we found them all. That child would come alive again while sitting there, composing, singing, playing. And who did they share those moments with? They shared them with their much beloved music teachers. And each time Marcus would return to school, a little shaky, what would people say? Will they judge me? Maybe in other parts of school where those same bullies from elementary school could be found taunting them. But in that music room, no way. Instead, they would walk in and be greeted with cheers and hugs and they were welcomed home. I am here to say that I know, and Marcus knows, that without middle school music, they would not be here today. I can tell you that music quite literally saved my child's life multiple times. And I know my child is not alone. I have been privileged to chaperone many, many music trips and events. And I know firsthand that many other children struggle with the same mental health challenges that Marcus and now their younger sister struggle with. Cedar Hill in a pre-COVID year had 15 ensembles and 80% of their student population involved in their music programs. Does it seem fair to cut those down to one ensemble that would be limited to the grade eight students? The proposed budget would see 18% of the proposed cuts come from music programs, 18%. Public education should be a system that makes education accessible and equitable for everyone, regardless of social or financial status, culture or religion. These cuts make music education accessible only for those who can afford it. In the press release where Kim Morris was welcomed to the district, Ms. Morris is quoted as saying she looked forward to advancing positive learning and work environments for students. Ms. Morris, I can assure you that cutting music school programs is not accomplishing that. There are multiple reasons to keep music in schools, but none more important than in a post-COVID world where we know the mental health for all of us is going to be an ongoing struggle. Please do your research, go and visit a middle school music class. Ask those students to tell you about the impact music has on their life. Visit a grade 12 music class, ask them about the importance of music. And for most of them, they'll tell you that that started at middle school, in grade six, with a patient teacher guiding them through those first few terribly off key classes into a magical place where music gives them a place to belong. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. McKinnon, and thank you for sharing your child's story with us and how they've been impacted. I, I just want to recognize that how vulnerable it is to, to share these challenges. And so thank you. Thank you so much. You spoke so beautifully. Uh, next, I will welcome Cindy Rumpf. And if I have mispronounced your name, please correct me. Oh, that was correct. Good thank evening. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you. 
Um, so good evening, members of the board and school trustees. My name is Cindy Romp, and I have been the te I've been a teacher in the Greater Victoria School District for over 18 years. I currently teach at Cedar Hill Middle School and am the president of the Greater Victoria Music Educators Association. I find our district strategic plan very interesting. You're proposing to cut music, the educational program that exemplifies a mission statement, vision statement, the three goals, the strategies listed, and each of the core values. I'm here today imploring you to reconsider the budget proposal aimed to drastically cut music programs in our schools. This proposed cut will affect over 2,500 middle school students and over 600 elementary string students. Even though I can explain to you how music fits into every aspect of the strategic plan, I will draw your attention to a few key points, mainly due to my time constraint. Our music programs are the embodiment of the mission statement. Students involved in music come from a variety of cultural, socioeconomic backgrounds and privilege. Music is a place where all of these students can come together and learn. They are kids who understand what it's like to be a part of a team, learn about accountability and discipline, about delayed gratification and mastering a skill without a screen. Music classes give them the safety to be vulnerable, to take risks and to explore personal expression. Music students are the builders of their school communities. Everyone is welcome to take part. Cutting our music program so drastically will have a devastating effect on these students' lives and will leave a void of missed opportunity for future students. This proposed budget cut is also about equality and equity. Cutting these programs will also dramatically shift the culture of our schools. Music is culture. Music is inclusion. Goal one, the benefits of music education are well documented and researched and clearly shows the benefits of the mind, body and overall well being of students. These truths and the science of music are not in dispute. However, the question of when to start learning. It is critical that band strings and choir are open to students as early as possible. Grade six is the year when students come to some big realizations about their identity. Music programs welcome students in and provide a safe, positive, fun, and challenging place to be during these formative and sometimes tumultuous years. Being connected to a community for the duration of middle school to be part of a team creating something beautiful and profound is particularly unique way to nurture the spirit. Music programs contribute to the healthy well-being of all students. This proposed budget is culturally unkind and strips away something that positively contributes to personal and academic success. Goal two, in the agenda package you've received this evening, there is a poignant letter from Sarah Rood, the District Indigenous Art and Culture Facilitator for our school district. Please read it. She points out that our middle school music programs are deeply connected to our Indigenous drumming program we have in our district. This program was created in partnership with both nations and knowledge keepers, song composers from the three island nations. This program is very unique in terms of the depth of protocols and the permissions to sing songs in the Western education system. She talks about responsibility of stewarding these 800 plus drums. The beautiful songs and the teachings we have been given is shared between all involved. Music teachers have been taught how to do this in a good way. There will be a huge problem if they are all of a sudden gone. When you bring the indigenous cultural ways of knowing and being into the Western system, this is all this always worries. Um, there's always worry that they can be mistreated, misunderstood, or appropriated. Sarah states that this program has been a source of pride for both Indigenous and non-Indigenous educators and community. With the defunding of middle school music programs, you'll put their whole story, their cultural pro drumming program, and the well-being of the drums in Pearl. This budget is culturally unkind. Goal three, this proposed budget is an attack on our vulnerable students and an attack on social emotional well being of our students. Music programs have provided a safe haven before and especially now during the pandemic. Through music, students can experience something special outside of their usual instruction with their classmates in the relative safety of school. For some students, band and choir and string classes are a lifeline and the reason why they attend school. In a year when so many special opportunities Opportunities have been cancelled because of the pandemic. Taking away music programs away now is another huge blow for them. These proposed budget cuts will drastically impact the culture of middle school and would cause irreversible damage. 
core values. Our music programs embody each of these. Our music programs also have deep ties in our community through groups such as the Victoria Symphony, the Pacific Opera, Naden Band, and countless others. Our students perform in parades and citywide events and other visible events in Victoria and throughout our province. In conclusion, this proposed budget is not congruent with the district's current strategic plan. This proposed budget shows a complete lack of understanding of what a music program is how it effectively meets and engages the diverse needs of children, how much it contributes to school culture, and a lack of understanding of the culture of the city of Greater Victoria itself. Should not the budget also reflect the needs Excuse of the me, you're, you're uh, a minute over time, if you can wrap up. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> you, fit, you fit a lot in. Thank you very much um, for sharing with us. Uh, next, I'll welcome Noel Davis. Yes, thank you. Good evening. You. Good evening, uh, school board trustees. My name is Noel Davis, and I'm here representing the Parents Advisory Committee for Brayfoot Elementary School. Thank you for listening to our concerns regarding the proposed cuts to music and inclusive education. During an arguably the hardest school year in quite some time, proposing drastically cutting elementary strings, district ukulele, and middle school music programs is unconscionable. If these cuts pass, we will decimate music programs across the district, preventing students from joining choir or strings until high school and limiting band to students grade eight and up. For so many children, music strongly connects them to their school community. It's a highlight for, of their day and it is so important to children's development. There's a proven and intrinsic link between music and math and reading achievement. For most parents, concerts are the only time they're able to see their children interact in the school environment. A huge and lasting concern from this pandemic is the mental health of our children. Nobody does math when they're sad or anxious. The arts fill that space. And it's not just about the learning of music as a skill. There's a camaraderie there that gives so many kids a place where they belong and feel safe and included. Music is one of the ways we can psychologically support our children at school. Music is also a healthy form of expression for children and a real source of pride and joy for many. The music teachers in our district are some of the most inspiring and passionate teachers and people we have ever met. By de depriving our kids of these teachers and the musical experience they provide, we rob the children of a special connection that is so needed during these difficult times. When we cut these music teachers out, we are cutting out not just the music programs, but all of the other enrichment these teachers bring to the lives of our children. As one of many examples we could share, a music teacher, Mrs. Romp from middle, uh, Cedar Hill Middle School, has been doing live Zoom baking classes every weekend that are open to all Cedar Hill students. They're two, sometimes three hours long and really well attended by uh, children from all cohorts. They are such a solace for the kids during these times of isolation and create a strong sense of unity. Looking toward the post-pandemic future, public school music programs provide the chance for some kids to, uh, to be exposed to music who otherwise may never have that opportunity. Our public schools are supposed to fill a mandate of equitable learning, and it should not be the case that only those who can afford it can have access to the world of music. This sweeping decision should not be made lightly as it ha will have repercussions for many years to come. It is irresponsible to cut these programs without more investigation and consultation with the community. We need to understand the, board, the broad impact of removing access to music programs for middle schools before even considering this. We strongly believe that we should not be making major cuts to our public schools at this time, and we question why we need to balance the budget this year. Part of the deficit we find ourselves in is short-term and COVID related. For example, we're not seeing the income from rentals or from international students as we do in typical years. We should not be permanently removing long-term programs to solve short-term problems. We should not be removing music from the middle schools in school district 61. Your own vision statement reads, each student within our world-class learning community has the opportunity to fulfill their potential and pursue their aspirations. We believe that the world-class learning community would not close the door on an aspect of education that is so fundamental, inclusive, and is recognized as intrinsic to children's development as music. 
Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for being here and sharing with us. Um, next up, I'll welcome Caitlin Davies. Thanks for being here, Caitlin. Thank you. Good evening, Ms. Waters, school trustees, Ms. Green, parents and allies, and school board staff. Uh, my name is Caitlin Davies, and I'm a parent here in School District 61. Thank you so much for the opportunity to provide input into the budget process this evening. Like so many in our community this week, I'm distraught to learn of the proposed budget cuts, which will be devastating to music education. I do not need to highlight the academic or socioeconomic benefits of music education. There are many experts who can speak very knowledgeably on these subjects and can highlight the extensive literature that validates that cuts to music education are extremely short-sighted and do not better anyone's future. Instead, I'll speak from the position I know best as a mother. I have six children, one in high school, one middle school, two in elementary, and two who will enter the school system in the next two years. As you can imagine, there's a lot of sibling rivalry in our house, but there's also a lot of role modeling from the older kids to the younger ones, and a lot of looking forward to what the rites of passage in the school system will bring. Ever since our eldest learned to play violin in grade five strings at Oakland's elementary, the conversation has always been when I get to do strings and when I'm in concert band. It is this anticipation that keeps them motivated, engaged, and enthusiastic to learn. Let's talk for a moment about my eldest child. She's now a teen in her first year at Oak Bay. Academically, she's great, but not a joiner and definitely at risk of social isolation. Particularly through this pandemic, she's struggling, as are so many of our youth. She's lost her sports, her social engagements, her part-time coaching job, but she still has band and the friends that come with band. One of the most reassuring things she said to us this year is that she's gonna stick with band because she feels a connection to her band teachers and that she belongs there. And considering what this pandemic has done to our children, that's pretty profound. So onto my middle school son. He's an amazing, kind, compassionate, insightful, neurodiverse kid who drives his teachers and parents absolutely nuts with his impulsivity and abundant energy. And you've guessed it, he loves music. Rhythms tapped out on every single piece of furniture, singing at the top of his lungs with his headphones on, you got the picture. As someone with significant learning disabilities and an anxiety disorder, music classes are the place that he can fit in, where he doesn't have to struggle with academics, where he gets positive reinforcement for having rhythm, where he goes out of his way to help his classmates to belong and feel comfortable, where he develops the confidence to audition for and perform a solo at a concert. Lansdowne Music has given him a place in the world. Now, I also have a daughter in grade five. She is so intensely proud to be in the strings program this year, lugging her cello through the neighborhood every Friday, diligently practicing, trying to teach her five-year-old brother to play. For the past two years, she has planned everything for middle school, choir, strings, learning trombone. These are the traditions of Lansdowne that she has witnessed and with which she already feels a sense of belonging. The landscape of normal has changed so radically for our kids in this past year. We cannot afford to dismantle the very institutions that they are counting on to still be there. If ever there's a time for schools to offer more, not less, it is now. As we come out of this pandemic, we need to work doubly hard to mitigate all the losses they've experienced and to protect a sense of normalcy, not add to the loss. My daughter is left feeling like everything gets canceled just when it's her turn. COVID took away the school play, track and field, being a lunch monitor. The school district does not need to be another virus by taking away the music. You may be wondering about my three younger children and quite frankly, I am too. What do they have to look forward to as they reach grade five and beyond? Will there be a music education legacy to benefit their development and give them options? Although we're all here to put the students first, this is not just about the direct benefits to learners. From my perspective, music is the heart and soul of these schools. What brings us parents into the school? Maybe some sports meets, but really it's the concerts. We so badly need connected and unified communities that are integrated with our schools, and that doesn't happen without a purpose to bring us together. I cannot finish without stating the obvious. Our music teachers are some of the most dedicated educators in the system, contributing immense passion and enthusiasm to our students' educations. The overwhelming uprising in reaction to this situation is a testament to them. And the benefits that the district realizes from music education go way beyond the FTEs that are funded, thanks to these teachers. 
As a parent, I don't know what to tell my child who's about to enter middle school, who's been looking forward to following in her siblings' footsteps, who's dreamed of grade six band since she was in primary grades, and who's been waiting for a chance to sing in a choir. The letter she herself wrote you all yesterday after school without any prompting or assistance, and I hope you find it in your packages, is heartbreaking. As both a healthcare professional myself and also a volunteer with a large youth organization, I'm also concerned for the adverse mental health outcomes that we see societally in youth We're, who cannot find their place. You're at school. five minutes if you can just wrap up, please. I Thank will you. indeed. Thank you so much. Um, the risks for those who will see their connection to community and their sense of belonging deleted before their eyes. I did want to say that as a citizen, a taxpayer and a voter, I echo Ms. Romp's comments about the strategic plan, our world-class learning community, supporting all learners, innovation, consistently seeking ways to make positive change. Mm, there is nothing world-class, innovative, positive or supportive around these changes. Your parent community is speaking, over 7,000 pieces of feedback in the thought exchange, nearly 6,000 signatures on the petition by tonight. Okay, thank you so much. Please hear our collective voice. Music education is not dispensable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I hate interjecting. It doesn't feel good, but it's my Fair job enough. to follow. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, next, I'll welcome Ellen Kelsey. And Miss Kelsey, if I've mispronounced your name, please correct me. No, that's perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm really pleased to have this opportunity and, and very much echo the sentiments of the previous speakers. Thank you. Thank you for those eloquent words, all of you. Um, I'm going to share my screen now because the, I'm here on behalf of Island Ukuleles, a, a district-wide program. And um, the students, when they heard about these proposed cuts, uh, got together and made this video for you. So I'm going to start with that. Can everyone see that? Great. And, and coming to you from Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, please give a warm California welcome to the Island Ukuleles. Island Ukuleles is a community. A sense of belonging. Outgoing. Passion. Exciting. Family. Friendship. Teamwork. Inclusive. Camaraderie. Comfort. Connections. A place to escape. Happiness. Empowering. My joy. Experiences. Fun. Good times. Connected me more to the music I listen to. Lets me express myself. I got to learn to play drums. Place of amazing opportunities. Ukulele is a really important part of me. Ukulele has given me confidence. Music for me gives me strength, knowledge, empowerment, confidence in myself. It brought me more opportunity than I can ever imagine. It's helped me be able to afford university. Island Ukulele is important to me because the people and the music were there when a lot of things in my life weren't. And it was a constant, a family that I could come to on Monday nights when the rest of my life was a bit of a mess. I need music in my life. So Island Ukuleles has been operating as a very unique and wonderful School District 61 program for, six, for 43 years. Um, throughout this presentation, I'll just be including some pictures to remind you of this historic legacy. So these are some of the earliest days of Island Ukulele. Each year, Island Ukuleles brings together more than 130 kindergarten through grade 12 students from 53 schools in Greater Victoria. What's important in, in this and your budget considerations is that all of the professional teaching staff, youth, teachers, parents, board members, volunteer thousands of hours to this program. The only funding that comes from School District 61 is a 0 0.125, sorry, 0 0.125 of teacher funding. And that single block of teaching time is only to enable that the high school students within Island Ukuleles have the opportunity for music credits. What that means is that cutting island ukuleles will save the school district only $16,000.
but it will cost the school district more than $300,000 worth of volunteer time every single year. Island Ukuleles delivers more bang for the buck for students from 53 Greater Victoria school programs than any other program. As, as our previous speakers have talked about, Island Ukuleles and other music programs do so much for mental and emotional health and well being. Um, this year of COVID, which we've talked about already, um, we saw drops in attendance at school, but students continuing to come to Island Ukuleles, both face to face and um, online, in order to really you know, support their emotional and mental well being. In addition, one of the cuts that has been put on the table is to remove 1, 000, the $1,000 that Island Ukuleles gets every two years to support a district-wide music concert, which is called Ukes Unlimited. That very small amount of money is again mobilized through Island Ukulele into hundreds of volunteer hours, which produces concerts that have involved thousands of students. And here's just an example from the 1980s of a Ukes Unlimited concert. You can see there's students in every single um, opportunity of a seat. Island Ukuleles has a wonderful peer teaching model where older students are, are really mentoring and teaching younger students and mixed age groups perform together. And we know from research such as this by Campbell, Connell and Beagle that that kind of you know, peer teaching brings together incredible results in terms of identity formation through music, emotional benefits, character building, life skills, social benefits, and positive impacts on the students, their families, and the teachers. Uh, previous speakers have mentioned this, and it's such an important point that diversity and equity and inclusion are important messages of the strategic plan for SD61, and that the kind of program that Island Ukuleles is is absolutely in line with you know, supporting vulnerable students. So cutting this kind of low cost, high impact program will end up costing SD61 more money in terms of psychological services and learning assistance. Students love making music with island ukuleles. There's all kinds of uh, you know, background research to show how important it is in terms of uh, cognitive skills, literacy, numeracy, all those sorts of things again, cultural exchanges. Cutting island ukuleles will also have a broader community impact. Throughout Island Ukuleles continues to perform in elementary schools every year, seniors events, and throughout COVID, Island Ukuleles has continued to play outside the windows of long-term care and assisted living facilities for residents during lockdown. It's an essential part of the um, Greater Victoria community. Also, Island Ukuleles is always raising funds to do national and international tours, which helps to promote a wider understanding of BC, Victoria, and Canada more broadly. So please do not cut the budget for Island Ukuleles. You would be cutting a vibrant 43-year-old program that delivers all of these benefits and more across 53 schools simply to save $16,000. That doesn't make educational or fiscal sense. And I'll end with the students one more time. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. I had um, in the avalanche of mail we've received, there was a letter that described island ukuleles as something strange and beautiful and downright weird. And I thought that was really <laughs> a wonderful tribute. Um, so thank you very much for coming and sharing some of uh, island ukuleles with us tonight. You're most welcome. Uh, our final speaker is Jesse Swan. Welcome. Uh, hi, um, I'm Jesse, and I'm a grade eight student at Cedar Hill. And I have been involved in the music program since grade five at, C at Doncaster Elementary. But I started music in grade one when I saw the grade fives perform their first concert. I decided I wanted to be as good as they were, so I started playing violin in grade one so I could be as good as the grade fives then. Um, since then, I've been in eight different ensembles, um, to, um, including four choirs, 
two strings and two bands, I would have not been able to have this opportunity without the school district's music programs. Um, it is a safe spot where I can be and express my creativity um, without worrying about how I, without worrying about other people's thoughts. Um, I've created a lot of my friendships there where less so in the classroom. Um, it is a reliable place where I can be. Um, the teachers um, create special relationships with all of their students. And, and um, Ms. Romp has a baking club where lots of people like to go every weekend and it's a bright spot of our weekends. Um, it's um, accessible for everybody in our school. So, and is a safe spot for us? I said that already, yeah, okay, whatever. Um, some students come to school only for the music programs and cutting it would um, be a major hit on our already weakened mental state due to the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse, so much. And thank you to Vicki Hanley for organizing our speakers and having the wisdom to put the student last because that's always a real tough act to follow. You make us proud. So thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, Ms. Rompf, clearly your baking club on the weekend is, is also hugely impactful. So I'm a little jealous that I don't get to join, but uh, thank you so much for all you're doing in our school communities. So thank you to all of our presenters tonight and there will be other opportunities um, for folks to come and present as well. We wanna hear from as many voices as possible as we move through this process. Um, next up, I'm going to pass this over to our secretary treasurer who's going to present the, the this is draft three of the budget and it has changed from draft two and likely will change again as we move through this process. So this is the first night for us to get a, a sort of a full look at what is being proposed. And so the idea is for a, you know an opportunity to ask clarifying questions. Um, the decision is quite a ways, six weeks away. We're working towards that and there, um, Secretary Morris will sort of articulate for us what are the stops and the opportunities uh, for the public to provide feedback and when trustees will have the opportunity to um, be debating these issues, but tonight we're really looking for clarifying questions and, and just getting a sense of, of where we're at. Um, Chair. And I'm hoping that everyone can hold their questions until the end of the presentation because there's quite a bit to get through. Chair, thank you. Um, just, well, I don't know if I can rise on a point of privilege at a board meeting without being a trustee, but uh, on page 333 of the presentation, there is reference to um, sacred cows. And I think that that's not only antagonistic toward the people who value these programs, but it's also innately re racist. And we ask that it be removed from the presentation and the agenda. Um, thank you, Chair. I believe that it has been removed from the presentation. We've had some discussions about this and I agree your, your concerns are, are well taken and I agree. Um, and if they're not removed from this presentation, they certainly will and that, and that would have been an error. So thank you for, for raising that. Um, and I'll leave it to Secretary Morris to guide us through and, and everybody please just hold your questions until the end. Thank you. Okay, good, e <clears throat> good evening, everyone. Uh, I think that uh, first we will start with uh, Superintendent Green to open the uh, presentation for us. Shelley? Thank you, uh, Kim, greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, presenters. Um, this is a difficult process and it's going to be long and arduous and sensitive. Nobody ever chooses to go through a process like this and looking at budget uh, concerns 
and needing to create a balanced budget. And at this point, these are all concepts that we've put forward and your voice, what you tell us, um, feedback that we receive are all going to be critical to making very tough decisions that we, as we get to this. So um, we're trying to make our very best in presenting the broadest view from some of these components that have come forward, trying to give depth of information. There are no choices or decisions that have been made. And certainly every effort to respect the amazing work that's gone on in our school district for so long. And yes, everything counts and everything is important. And it's really tough to go through this process. So respectfully, I want to let all you, especially people who presented tonight, to know that we do respect what you've said for sure. We are listening with wide open ears. We truly have appreciated the feedback that's come so far and we expect to receive a whole lot more. <laughs> These will be adjustments all the way along. It's a process. And as difficult as that is, and as tough as to see anything that we love and embrace on the list of, of possibilities, your voice is going to be the critical element on us on figuring out how we get to this place of balance. So once again, thank you. Um, I know how hard this is, and please know how much we absolutely respect and appreciate all the incredible work that goes on. And, uh, and we look forward to hearing more as we move through this process. So at that, I will turn it over to Kim. Thank you, Shelley. I'm just going to share my screen. Can everyone see the cover sheet of the PowerPoint? Okay, great, thank you. Um, I put most of you off to the side so I can see it myself. So uh, I'll count on the chair to interrupt me if she needs to. Um, I think uh, what Superintendent Green opened with is uh, completely true. Uh, this is a very difficult uh, position for us to be in as we go forward together. Um, and, uh, everything that is considered as a savings or a reinvestment here, and especially the savings, is uh, not a judgment. It is uh, an examination of our organization and a prioritization of our organization. So I hope that we can look at it that way. Oops, sorry, I'm sharing the wrong thing. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, as we move through a budget, I would like us to be thinking about this alignment to our strap plan. And we heard uh, a couple of our presenters align to the strap plan. And as we have our conversations and uh, discuss all the considerations and make some uh, tough decisions in this budget year and perhaps the next budget year after that, uh, this is a very important slide to keep in mind. And so with student learning at the middle, at the core of everything we do, how are we aligning our human and financial resource um, resources to strap plan, board work plan, district operational plan, school growth plan for that ultimate student success for uh, as many students as we can for each and every learner. Uh, this is a slide you'll have seen before in our uh, presentations. So we were trying to shift from 2020, 2021, which was a rollover budget this year uh, we used uh, $10 million in surplus to balance, uh, and we're trying to shift over to the right-hand side to 21-22, where we're living within our means and we're improving student success. In the superintendent, this uh, draft three is what we call the superintendent's recommendations, and it's really staff's recommendations. So the senior leadership team in consultation with their teams, um, bringing a balanced budget to the board for its consideration. And that's exactly what it is. Uh, we'll be asking for the board to put this on the floor tonight uh, for about six weeks before a final decision is made. So the main tenets of this budget are alignment to the learning needs of our students and living within our means. We've had an over-reliance on unspent funds from the current year to balance the budget of the ne next year. Our initiatives have been come, become somewhat ingrained uh, and have not been prioritized for quite some time. 
we have uh, key indicators where we have not moved our students' results over time. And here I will reference the six-year completion rate as an example uh, between the overall population in School District 61 and our Indigenous learners. That has been a 30% spread over at least the last five years. And so those are the key indicators we're looking at and how to move those forward. Regardless of budget constraints, uh, this must be a priority for any board if it is to advance its strategic plan. As uh, Superintendent Green said, this is an extremely difficult exercise. There's no uh, way to sugarcoat that or to um, explain that away. Um, it is also a time of renewal as we have to prioritize and uh, realign to that strategic plan uh, for the most important things in terms of how we advance some of those key indicators and uh, advance student learning for success. The assumptions in draft three uh, are still that the numbers will change between start to finish. We know we haven't finished our discussion. Uh, in this draft, the deficit is covered, savings have been identified, reinvestment is identified, uh, surplus has been projected, and this budget is balanced. I'll speak about the operating budget first. And so when we last met, uh, we had presented uh, down in the bottom right hand side about a $7.1 million deficit. Uh, in yellow are the changes since the last time we talked. On the revenue side in yellow, we've identified uh, over time where uh, we have contributed to benefit and payroll deductions to our uh, benefit carriers for things like uh, dental and extended health, et cetera. And those reserves have built up over time because um, we have not used the uh, services that we were insured for uh, to the extent that we contributed to them. So this has been a buildup over time. Uh, this is a one-time payout. Uh, we would not recognize this year upon year upon year. Uh, but we are able to withdraw from that plan $1 million in this fiscal year, and we will put that in the revenue stream as surplus for next year. So that's new since the last draft. On the right-hand side, we see the expense side, and um, we see a reduction of 5.8 uh, million in wages and benefits, and we see a reduction in services and supplies of 237,000. Uh, this creates a revenue of 211.939 and expenses of 211.939 and that therefore the budget is balanced in this draft. Draft two uh, was a deficit. Uh, we had a decrease in revenue of 3.6 million and an increase in expense of 3.4. And that's how we arrived at the shortfall that we looked for and balanced in this draft of 7.143. Um, we're going to go through uh, some of the savings and reinvestment and uh, to cover off the 7.143. And in blue, savings are identified. And in red uh, is the reinvestment. So uh, this is really an exercise in uh, trying to make that space that you've heard me talk about in terms of how do we reinvest in ourselves in the priorities that align to the strategic plan. And we may agree or disagree on what those are. And that's the purpose of the budget debate and the discussion. So how did we balance? And it's important to reiterate one more time that these are considerations for the board's deliberation and definitely open to feedback before decisions are made. Uh, first of all, under administration, uh, we will be um, uh, staffing packups went out without uh, 1.0 FTE per school uh, administration time. And this is a uh, vice principal time. Uh, and this is at every school. So just a couple of things to note here. Uh, for elementary VPs, this is the same uh, situation we'd be in in the last couple of years where uh, we claw that uh, staffing back. And we look at the surplus in July and August, and we decide whether we can put the point one back into admin time for vice principal at elementary. So for elementary vice principals, this is no different than last year or the year before. 
What is new in this uh, consideration is that there is a 0.1 vice principal reduction at middle and secondary, which has not occurred in the last uh, few years. So because vice principals, um, when they don't have admin time, they teach, uh, having less admin time allows them to teach more, which has an impact on staffing of uh, less teachers. At the board office, we're proposing a clerical, um, oh, the learning team reduction of 2.6. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, um, Deb and Harold and uh, um, Collins team. There are 2.6 less principals and vice principals on this team in this draft of the budget. Uh, proposed uh, reduction in clerical time of 1.5 FTE at the board office. And the addition or the reinvestment of a com second communications person support for our manager of um, communications. So this would be a 1.0 uh, QP position. Uh, in terms of careers and pathways, uh, in draft two of the budget, we had uh, a $127,000 um, contingency. We have rolled that contingency into a balancing strategy. So therefore the contingency for path and pathway and partnerships is not there. So the risk here is if projected enrollment uh, for pathway and partnerships uh, ITA, et cetera, decreases, uh, there would be a further uh, adjustment to the budget in a, in a downward uh, way in order to continue to balance. Clerical in schools. Uh, staffing to schools in terms of clerical is provided through uh, what we call clerical hours and what we call student school assistant hours. And this budget proposes to um, reduce the school assistant hours by about 346, so 356 hours. Um, and so what's important to note here are school assistants uh, do a variety of tasks, uh, anything from a lab assistant at Oak Bay to some clerical duties to supervision. Uh, and uh, sometimes, and I'm sure I haven't covered off the entire list, um, sometimes working with some of our uh, medically fragile uh, students. So um, what we've done in this budget for principals is we have combined uh, clerical and school assistant hours together in order to give them the greatest flexibility to staff the way their unique school needs to be staffed. But this is a, a reduction in QP 947 of about 10.4 FTE and is represented by about 350 school assistant hours. Counselors, uh, important to note here, uh, we shifted five of our counselors from the operating fund to the community link fund, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And this was an attempt to retain uh, our counselors without having to reduce them. Something that is important to note uh, for those of you who are familiar with the collective agreement uh, for teachers is that uh, counselors have a ratio in school district 61 uh, minimum that we must staff. And uh, the current number of counselors in our budget right now are seven over that ratio. So uh, it's a clear indication of investment by the board uh, in counselors at all levels of the system. So secondary to elementary. So uh, just to keep in mind, uh, we are over our ratio here by seven. But we uh, chose to keep uh, all the counselors that we had in 2021. Uh, the district team, in terms of Tolmi, uh, what Im impacts does this budget or, or uh, uh, savings uh, balancing strategies did we find with the district team? Uh, schools, each school received about uh, ten to eleven thousand dollars in school collaboration time, uh, and this was uh, intended for the principal to use at their discretion. Uh, this is mostly TTOC time. There is no fixed FTE here uh, generally. And so uh, we would say the staffing impact is on TTOC time. The next four items are uh, annual rollover grants that the district team would use uh, at their discretion to support schools. And so uh, as a saving strategy in order to reinvest in the strategic plan later, uh, this is considered uh, not in budget in draft three. In facilities, we have um, an energy manager that is new to us, and that is cost shared with BC Hydro. 
And the other part of that salary comes out of our annual facilities grant, not our operating budget. Uh, and so we've tasked this person and the intent was always that they find enough savings to pay their salary and contribute to the district's bottom line. And so this person, uh, energy manager, is tasked with finding $150,000 savings in uh, uh, energy management in school district 61. Uh, we have uh, been very fortunate, uh, as all school districts have been, in terms of federal and provincial money in the 2021 school year. Uh, and we have been able to bump up our custodial hours in terms of uh, taking care of some of that cleaning all day and deep cleaning at night. Uh, we don't have uh, those hours uh, in the budget for next year because provincial and federal supports for COVID were one time. And so uh, there's a small amount here uh, in COVID contingency, uh, should we need to attend to more cleaning supplies or additional staffing. And that's a reinvestment. Similar in the finance department, similar to the um, amount we added to surplus for the benefits payout, uh, for our QP benefits, um, again, our reserves have built up over time uh, where uh, the, the deductions or the payments we make to the carrier are more than the usage that people have um, had uh, during COVID in previous years. And so we are not able to withdraw this in cash as we were with the other uh, benefit item, but we are able to take a premium holiday and so this means we tell the carrier we're going to take a premium holiday for two or three months this year. And it simply means the employer portion of expense of uh, benefits uh, does not have to be remitted. And the employee uh, portion is also a holiday for the employee. And this is a savings or uh, a savings on our, our benefit expense side of about $300,000. In terms of inclusion, uh, education assistance staffing adjustment is proposed to be reduced by $685,000. And this represents um, uh, the difference between uh, the 2% increase in uh, wages and the 2021 uh, wages. And so the dollar amount in uh, education assistant or special ed uh, staffing right now is the same as it is in 2021. Um, and does not take into account the 2% increase. It does mean, of course, employees will receive the 2% increase. It just means we may have less EAs as we kick off our preliminary budget. And um, uh, we will monitor the uh, identification of unique student needs as we move throughout uh, spring and summer and into fall and adjust that accordingly. In terms of gifted supports, uh, gifted, uh, received extra staffing in uh, our rollover budgets for the last number of years. And these are proposed to be uh, savings now. And the uh, gifted teacher supports or gifted teacher um, duties or uh, tasks will be taken up by the school-based team. And lastly, uh, one FTE uh, education assistant reduction at Victor are proposed here. In terms of international, uh, in a typical year or a rollover budget, the international department would fund or would staff secondary schools um, at a ratio of 18 to one. So for every 18 international students, the secondary school would receive one teacher FTE. We know that the average class size in our district from grade eight to 12 is 20.5. And so in draft three of the budget, we consider uh, increasing that ratio so that uh, we save uh, some money on uh, teachers uh, by uh, increasing that ratio from the international program. The risk here is that uh, it may impact some course offerings uh, or where there are very small classes. But there may be some choices to be made at secondary. In terms of literacy, uh, this budget proposes to eliminate the reading recovery coordinator, and this is a contract of about $73,000. Uh, we propose that the district portion of reading recovery staffing be redeployed to other areas of teacher staffing uh, uh, to meet ratio. 
in the areas of uh, student support, school-based team, et cetera. So the, while there's no reduction here, uh, it is reallocated to teacher staffing. Uh, reading recovery as a trademark or copyright program uh, would not uh, be supported from the district's perspective. Um, uh, schools still receive the amount that they contributed to reading recovery. And uh, in red here, we see a reinvestment. Uh, and this was a motion that went to equity committee and came back from equity committee uh, to ops uh, and referred here to the budget process where a uh, literacy K to five balance support of 500,000 be reinvested into um, schools. And depending where schools are at in their literacy programs uh, will depend on what kind of supports are provided and the uh, level of allocation that will be provided to schools. So reinvestment there. In terms of music, now this is uh, very important. Uh, we know we've had lots of feedback on this. And so um, it was important for us to be able to articulate what we spend in our district on music. And this is part of the examination of our organization. It's not to say these things are not important, but it's to lay out plainly and transparently uh, what we spend in the district on uh, music. And so uh, this is very familiar to the people who provided feedback. So middle school band is identified uh, at nine teachers for a million dollars. Uh, strings and choir is 2.7 teachers for 300. Elementary strings, 1.89 at 213,000. Ukulele, as we heard spoken to, um, 16,000. And some district fine arts uh, uh, line item here of 12,000. What's important to note in red is the, so when we hear that the music program is decimated, I understand it's a very uh, impactful um, amount that we look at here, but I do want to note the reinvestment. And so uh, we do see that uh, grade eight band is important for feeder, for our feeder sector or as a feeder for our secondary school band program. And so the consideration in this draft of the budget is to add back some staffing for um, grade eight band. And I wanted to mention a couple of things about this because it's definitely been the most um, emailed about so far. So always in budget, I try to reach out and find out what happens in other school districts, uh, just because we get caught up in what we do all the time and uh, what historically has happened here. Uh, and this is not to discount the uniqueness of our school district. And of course, we're going to be different than others, but it is um, a context piece for us. So uh, I had five out of 11 respondents to my question to other school districts uh, have middle school. So I got 11 responses back and five have middle school. And none of them provide additional staffing at middle school. Uh, they run music, but they don't provide any additional staffing other than what occurs within the timetable with no extra staffing. And so um, that's important to note uh, that we have enjoyed uh, great levels of um, staffing to enable a lot of these programs. Um, we talk about alternative delivery methods. Could music be um, a club such as sports with volunteers? Uh, could we run th music through prep uh, as we do with uh, gym? Uh, could it be an exploratory rotation or an exploratory that's chosen by students year round uh, within the uh, staffing provided to a middle school uh, with no extra staffing provided. Is there a trade-off elsewhere in exploratories? Uh, should we be looking at shops and art and foods in order to uh, offset this reduction and maybe uh, prop it up a little by impacting another section of uh, exploratories? Um, and should we start to think about uh, schools that perhaps have a focus uh, like a fine arts school or um, some sort of um, focus where we can supplement more than less. <clears throat> it's also important to note around the uh, music or, or the levels of schools that we have, elementary and middle school are funded on headcount. And so it doesn't matter how many uh, activities or courses, let's call them, you take at middle school, the maximum amount of funding we can get for a middle school student is 1.0. Um, whereas at secondary, uh, currently the funding formula allows us to um, 
be funded per course. So a student taking eight courses is one FTE and a student taking 12 courses is 1.5 FTE. So I just want to make sure that we understand the funding conundrum we're in, in terms of adding these extra supports to middle. Uh, we uh, do not get funded for any of these extra activities that students are doing. Uh, and whereas the secondary model is much simpler because there is per course funding there. And uh, lastly, yes, I just wanted to re-identify the, um, the reinvestment here. If you hear uh, cutting all music and uh, we wanna be sure that we're uh, pointing out that there is a reinvestment here and whether that's enough or not is uh, up for debate. And we know we will agree or disagree on that. And that's what the discussion is about. District programs. So uh, because we've had a rollover budget and have been trying to support schools as much as we can, there's a, a historical staffing level that's been provided to schools that used to um, um, host uh, district programs like behavior support or low incidence. And so this budget pr proposes to remove those uh, staffing levels from those schools who no longer have those programs. And uh, redeploy in uh, teacher staffing in order to meet ratio. So not a reduction here, but uh, removing that uh, district program staffing from those schools who no longer have district staff, district programs. In terms of technology, uh, we propose to uh, reduce by one QP uh, FTE in this budget uh, because uh, we, um, inserted uh, during COVID, we received that one-time funding and some of it was for technology for students who were not attending school to be able to access uh, their courses and their teachers and things like that on Zoom. And so out of that federal and provincial money, we injected uh, 1,500 Chromebooks into the system between June uh, 2020 and during fiscal 2021 this year. And we also injected 200 iPads. So the idea here is that the district uh, forego the $339,000 commitment that it makes to student device replacement for this year only because of that large injection from federal and provincial money. And just to put it in context, we uh, injected 1500 Chromebooks and 200 iPads this year. And normally we would buy uh, 950 Chromebooks or 781 iPads or some combination of those two. So we are more than covered for um, student devices for this year. And perhaps uh, we can even look at this for next year. And I know Andy's keeping a, a close eye on what uh, ratios look like in things. Um, there's a reinvestment here of $200,000 uh, for when temporary teachers are filling in for a teacher that has a laptop, but the laptop's not at the school. Uh, this would be for posted positions. And as we phase out desktop computers and classrooms, uh, we want uh, teachers to have the tools to do the job regardless of their uh, appointment status. And uh, this last one is new, uh, network infrastructure replacement. This was a late addition on Friday. Thank you, Andy, for bringing this forward and uh, completing the work on this. Um, and so, what we've identified in our network infrastructure is um, about a $2.6 million end of life um, uh, issue over the next five years. And so this $406,000 is intended to be year one of five. And this would be an ongoing cost to the budget that would need to occur. Uh, this uh, infrastructure involves switches and servers and um, uh, Mr. Canty took a close look at where and when our devices, our switches and servers were starting to uh, reach the end of their useful life uh, and when they would and what kind of risk were we willing to take in terms of um, extending their lives beyond that um, safety period. And so this is what uh, this amount means here. In terms of uh, strategic plan alignment, this is where we start to reinvest. And let's keep in mind that the um, uh, we did receive a new line item of funding in the 2021 school year called equity of opportunity. And that was about a million dollars. 
And we treated that as new money in order to uh, push some supports out to the system to try to um, change some of those key indicators or some of those results that we had been seen, that we had been being seen as not moving for quite some time. Uh, and so uh, this budget um, equity of opportunity, we treated as uh, part of the block and most districts did that last year. We were unique in terms of uh, trying to treat it as new money uh, in order to uh, make some investment in the system. So I just want you to keep in mind while this reinvestment looks like a lot of money, it's um, a million plus uh, less than it was uh, during the 2021 school year for the uh, learning team itself. And so you can see the various uh, reinvestment uh, amounts here. And there's a little bit more detail uh, um, in the uh, packet. I want to just talk about Community Link for a minute because we know we moved some counselors here. So in terms of savings in Community Link in order to make room for those counselors in order to keep them, uh, we are contemplating removing $300,000 from the youth and family counselor contracts in Community Link. Uh, impact on staffing here is nil. These are not uh, employees, uh, although provide a very important um, uh, service and we know that. Uh, so this will definitely be an item for discussion. We also uh, reduced the amount of food um, or the uh, dollar that we're, dollar amount we're spending on food. Um, and uh, Associate Superintendent Caldwell has done a good job of canvassing and uh, sending this out. And again, this is a discussion point uh, and we'll see what we can uh, accomplish with this. And again, uh, where we saw a learning team reduction of 1.6 FTE in operating, uh, part of the um, staffing on the learning team is quoted to, to um, Community Link. So when that, uh, those people are gone, there's a 0.4 that will be saved in Community Link as well. And lastly, in red, we see the reinvestment of $564,000 uh, into Community Link in order to retain those five counselors uh, so that we can uh, keep the same complement that we had this year. So draft three also includes, uh, so already built into the budget and not part of the deficit uh, because it was already in draft two. We're anticipating a rentals increase, a combination of um, some of our third party gym and field rentals coming back about 50%. And then um, uh, the addition of uh, some increased revenue on the Brayfoot lease of land. Uh, to the CSF for their temporary home. Uh, we did see an increase in uh, international students in this budget. And so within the uh, draft three is a 1.1 net profit increase. Uh, so we saw about 250 more students come in. Uh, and so that's a net uh, gain to the district. During the 21, 2021 school year, using 1920 surplus, we had set up a reserve for any ups and downs in terms of uh, student enrollment and international. And this was to try to provide a buffer uh, so that if there were swings in enrollment, uh, we wouldn't necessarily have to reduce our staff. Uh, given the situation with the deficit this year, that um, reserve is now rolled up into a balancing strategy. Uh, there are two older um, board motions, one around learning commons and one around secondary resources. The Learning Commons uh, motion was passed in September 2017. Uh, this money has remained unspent, a portion of it since then, so we'll be asking the board tonight to rescind the motion as it pertains to the unspent amount. Uh, and there was also in September 2016 a secondary resources motion, and this money has been carried forward for several years, and we'll be asking the board to rescind that motion um, in terms of the unspent amount of $242,000. And that is in the budget to help us balance. We know that we had some uh, severe pressures around shops. And uh, based on the shop report recommendation to refer shops to this uh, budget process, here we are. And so what we're proposing to do with the dust collection and this is the 1.2 million that we'll have to spend for some time to come. Uh, we are proposing to put this on the uh, five-year annual capital plan for minor capital. And so removing it from operating and trying to find another source for it. Um, 
uh, not entirely sure how successful we'll be here. Uh, and if not successful, then we will have to review about how we're going to uh, bump up or attend to our dust collection systems. In addition, uh, year two is uh, 21-22 of our uh, shop safety mitigation. So uh, painting of lines, signage, moving of equipment for safety, et cetera. And again, stemming from the shop's uh, recommendations. Uh, this 350,000 was intended to come out of operating, but because of the situation, uh, we have moved this to annual facilities grant. Uh, what I want us to be um, knowing here is that um, annual facilities grant is a very small amount in, in relation to what our facilities team has to take care of over time. This is everything from roofing to lighting to heating to uh, any kind of system replacement. And so to move this 350 to AFG is not without consequence in terms of some of the other work that had been intended to be done uh, on our uh, buildings. In draft three, we uh, considered the following items, but they are not included in draft three. Late French immersion, we're going to watch each year. Um, we struggle with two smaller classes. And so we're always wondering if we can reduce from five to four. And so we'll keep our eye on that and where possible we will, but it is dependent on year to year enrollment. For example, in the 21-22 year, as uh, numbers played out so far with enrollment, we are not able to reduce that class right now. Uh, we talk about uh, reduction in daytime custodians. Several districts do not have daytime custodians in every school. Uh, they have fly crews that attend to some of the daytime work and uh, they move more hours into the nighttime where the building is empty and more uh, deep cleaning can happen without the traffic in the school. We know during COVID uh, and the phasing out of COVID and the fact that we have very little contingency for COVID cleaning that this is not something we considered uh, this year, but we will consider it as we move throughout the next few years. Um, not to say it will happen, but it will be on the list. Um, elimination or reduction in small school vice principals. We have several uh, schools that are less than 300 in enrollment and each of them has a vice principal and we wonder if that's uh, something we can continue to sustain. That is not included in this year's budget because uh, notice and severance are required and so it will need to be a discussion that we start uh, soon in order to realize those savings in the next fiscal year. District education assistance. This is a district deployed uh, um, sort of education assistant plus. And uh, so we take a look at uh, where those are deployed um, and if they're able to, if the work they're doing is able to be done by an education assistant general. And uh, exempt management staff, uh, same thing as principals and vice principals, not part of a collective agreement, but individual contracts that have notice and severance requirements in them. So if we are to talk about this line item, it would need to be a savings for next year and sub or 22, 23 and subsequent years. And you'll note that there are no QP382 reductions. Most of the QP, all of the QP reductions you've seen here are 947. And so uh, throughout this budget process, what we'll start to uh, show you is that over time, and especially back to 2008, uh, QP382 was severely uh, cut in terms of AFG funding. And, um, and so we wanna make sure that with the aging infrastructure we have, the older buildings that we have, uh, that we are able to take care of our health and safety in terms of that infrastructure. And so this uh, line item does require further uh, analysis, but at this time we have not considered any QP382 reductions at facilities. And I just would remind you that uh, facilities is taking on that um, uh, second year of shops that are the annual facility grant. So what did we, um, just to wrap up balancing strategies, we tried to um, examine every option we could think of and it's by no means a complete list. Uh, if you have ideas, uh, we need to hear from you. Is there something we have not looked at? Uh, all options are on the table and uh, will continue to be so for uh, the next few weeks. Um, we recognize there's lost opportunity and there are impacts of these saving strategies. There is no way 
to talk ourselves out of that or to change the narrative on that. It is a matter of prioritization in terms of uh, how do we change results for uh, those learners who are struggling. And that's really uh, the crux of uh, this budget. It is also important to point out that during the 21-22 budget, our $7.1 million was needed to balance draft three, but we used 3.7 surplus also. <clears throat> and so that's really a 10.7 million total deficit. And I want us to understand that the balancing strategies or some of the savings that we've shown here are ongoing. So they will occur year after year and we can count on them if we stick to them to uh, provide us with $5.5 million in savings. But it's important to note that 5.2 million of the balancing strategies are one time only. And so when we talk about those uh, benefit uh, withdrawals and things like that, those are just one time. And so as we move into 22, 23 and 24, 25, if the 21, 22 services remain the same and there's no increase in funding, further savings would need to occur. So this is not a one year discussion unless our revenue stream improves either through international or regular enrollment. Uh, there's um, more detail on the last page of the budget presentation. And I will just, uh, I think, <clears throat> we'll just talk about next steps for a minute. Uh, so obviously we're here to talk about or to present to you draft three of the budget, the balanced budget. Uh, and what of the savings uh, strategies that you've seen are impactful to you and we've heard loud and clear about music and what of the reinvestment strategies ring true for you in terms of alignment to the strategic plan this is the board's time to gather information and understanding of the impacts we need to make sure that that alignment is at the forefront of our minds as a staff we'll continue to monitor enrollment and we'll continue to monitor our surplus projection are there additional uh, revenues coming in or additional unspent monies at the end of the year that we could be adding back? We have sent out a very conservative spring staffing um, pack up for schools as our uh, HR processes commence for collective agreement timelines. So how will we be informing the board? The board has extended its budget process to May 31st. Uh, we will be presenting our thought exchange results, which closed on the 12th, and uh, we're open for two weeks or three weeks, uh, and something that we do each year. I was asked on CBC Radio this morning that um, the, the agenda was just published on Friday, and your feedback tool closed yesterday. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we know this is an annual um, tool that we use and it's not the only tool that the board uses. So uh, we'll talk about more opportunities here. If you have feedback or your um, members do or other parents in your pack have uh, feedback um, and please don't resend the same music feedback. We do have all of that. Um, but any new information or questions can be sent to budget at sd61.bc.ca and we'll make sure that that's compiled for the board. Uh, we're proposing five working sessions for the board for trustees to understand considerations, impacts of options, and request further in information or analysis from staff. It's important to note that these working sessions are for trustees and staff to work together. Um, and working sessions uh, do not uh, end with recommendations or motions and no decisions are made at them. They're simply an uh, opportunity for the trustees to have an informal conversation with staff about some of the areas of uh, investment and uh, sa saving strategies. Uh, next Wednesday, there'll be a public information meeting, a presentation and table talk through Zoom. And we're hoping that we can facilitate this in such a way it may take the place of talking tables. Uh, and this is an opportunity to sit down with um, community members, whether they be staff, um, uh, parents, etc., to talk about some of the impacts of this budget. And closely following that, the same night or the next day, a prioritization survey will come out. And so uh, all of the uh, balancing strategies and reinvestment 
uh, items uh, in this presentation will be on a survey for people to prioritize, as well as any new ideas that uh, may come forward uh, in the next week or so in terms of what did we miss. On May 10th, we are uh, planning a special in-camera for presentations from partners individually. Uh, this is a practice that I notice in other districts, and so I think it may be beneficial uh, where uh, GBTA or uh, QP may have a, sort of a one-to-one -one conversation with uh, trustees around the impacts of this budget on their membership. And May 17th, uh, we will ask uh, stakeholders to provide a presentation at the regular open board meeting. And then the board will debate second reading and hopefully pass second and third reading so that the budget is uh, wrapped up by May 31st. Uh, if more time is needed, uh, May 17th is uh, two weeks before the 31st. Informing principals, we have administrators meetings, uh, our district allocation working group, uh, we will ask you to participate in the prioritization survey and uh, we will send you invites to present to trustees. Informing partners, uh, we know we have labor management and liaison meetings with our unions. Uh, I, we are attending or can attend staff meetings or other meetings as invited. Uh, April 21st is an information session to understand the considerations. There is the prioritization survey from April 21st to May 5th. Uh, we will also uh, be inviting you to those May 10th and 17th um, feedback or presentation times. And there are regular committee and board meeting presentation times available to uh, the public. Uh, so we have uh, April 26th board meeting, May 3rd education committee meeting, May 10th operations committee meeting, and the May 17th board meeting. And those all have opportunities for uh, presentation. Informing the public, the information session will be April 21st. Again, the prioritization survey will be open. We are always accept written submissions and we are asking emailed submissions to go to budget at sd61.bc.ca. And again, those regular committee and board meetings on uh, April 26th, May 3rd, 10th and 17th. So today uh, for second reading, we're asking the board to put draft three of the budget on the floor. We're not asking you to give second reading to the bylaw today. We know that uh, you need time to understand the impacts of this budget and to see if there are any great ideas out there in terms of other things that we've missed. And so we're asking you to put that on the floor until May 17th, uh, at which time you, uh, we'll ask you to debate second reading and give second reading to the budget bylaw and give third and final reading to the budget bylaw. And keeping in mind, uh, draft four of the budget may not look like draft three, depending on the feedback we get. So second reading, uh, operating is 211-939-963. It may change by May 17th. Second reading special purpose is $27.6 million. And again, may change, but unlikely. Uh, depending on uh, those uh, amounts are usually fixed by the ministry. And just to remind you, some of our special purpose are ministry restricted and some are internally restricted. And just to give you an idea of those special purpose uh, funds, uh, we've listed them here. Um, and whether they're ministry restricted or internal, what their short name is, uh, as we tend to refer to them, the preliminary amended budgets for this year, as well as the preliminary budget for the upcoming year and where you can see the differences in that uh, um, funding. First reading for capital is 12.4 million. Again, that may change, but unlikely for second uh, and third reading. And our major capital right now is Vic High. Uh, we are hoping for an announcement on Cedar Hill and we're not sure what else will get approved in our minor capital. Uh, whether that be carbon neutral, school enhancement, playground, building envelope. And this is where we hope in our minor capital to find that $1.2 million for the dust collection systems. The so second reading consolidated is 2520498428422. And I do note there is a change to be made on the ministry template. Uh, and so that does not, um, because of that late entry, 
uh, due to the network infrastructure. The ministry template is not quite balanced to this, but this is the bylaw amount. So key milestones again after tonight is May 17th, uh, second and third reading, May 31st, budgets complete, um, May and June, staffing processes complete and are con commence and complete. We have a lot of pressures on us. Uh, we have some economic downturn, uh, some uncertainty in our enrollment aging facilities, uh, but we still have to have that commitment to student need. And this can be overwhelming because it really comes down to uh, how do I choose? Uh, what information can I use to help me make my decision? Uh, it's our role together, uh, me, uh, my team, uh, superintendent and her team, and you uh, to provide clarity and relevant data and complete information to make way for the implementation of education initiatives. And I think this is uh, something that the board has not um, been really given permission to do because of the rollover budgets and some of those ingrained initiatives, but the board has legal, legal labor, fiscal and facility responsibilities that, that really come to the forefront, whether it's lead and water, um, the, uh, the deferred maintenance on our buildings, the shops upgrades that need to be done. I think that we always want to put as many resources as we can in the classroom. And uh, this is really something the board must turn its mind to in terms of its responsibilities. And really the board is the vehicle to make change in our system and to meet diverse needs. Um, and hopefully by formulating a thoughtful comprehensive budget, we really do set the course for success uh, in our school district and our, in our community and in our society. And really that's at the heart of all we do. And I believe that's the common ground that we all um, can agree on and uh, come together in terms of um, a budget that will try to advance uh, some of these tenants. And the last slide is just that alignment slide again uh, and wanting you to always uh, start and, and end with student learning at the heart, at the core, and how we're aligning uh, for student success in everything we do. So thank you very much for your um, attention, and I'll turn it back to the chair. Okay, thank you so much. That's a lot of information. I wonder if we wanted to take a, like a two minute recess, a little bio break, if anybody needs to grab a glass of water or um, would any trustee be interested in doing that? Would require a motion. Thank you, Trustee Ferris, Trustee Leonard. Any debate? Seeing none, all those in favor of recessing for two minutes? Okay, thanks everyone. I just, I, I don't want anybody to feel pressed <laughs> as we enter the discussion. So let's take two minutes here. Back at 7.36. Sorry, Chair, did you ask for against and abstain there? I'm not sure. It looked like it was all in favor. Were you, did I miscount? Uh, I didn't vote at I all. I didn't vote. And, I, and I'm not in favor. I would just okay. whatever works for you. All those opposed? I think that's Trustee Painter and Whitaker. Okay, we'll be back at 7.37 now.
Okay, I'll call us back to order. I'll just wait till I see everybody's returned. Thanks again, uh, Secretary Treasurer Morris and to your whole team, because I know this is a real group effort and there have been lots of folks who've been working on various pieces of this. So I just really want to recognize and, and uh, with appreciation all the effort that goes into this. I know it's it's difficult on, on all sides. Um, so I believe what we're going to do now is do questions on the presentation and then we'll move into C2 to the motions. And then the bylaw is going to be put on the floor, laying on the floor, but we're not debating it tonight. And so um, I'm sure everybody's got lots of um, opinions and perspectives to share, but I want to make sure that we're really creating space for those clarifying questions that are going to help us as we work towards um, getting all the information that we need to make good decisions. So I'll uh, open up the floor, Trustee Rob Painter. Uh, just a, a point of clear or a question. First off, uh, is this uh, is this going to be a multiple question and uh, stakeholders are involved scenario, or is this uh, uh, once around as per board? Our formal um, representatives from our stakeholder, our partners who sit at the table are welcome to ask uh, questions. I think it would be nice if we move around the table so that everybody gets a chance to ask a question rather than any one individual asking 18 questions. There are going to be many other opportunities for us to ask questions. So I'm, I'm certain we probably will not get to through all of it tonight. We're scheduled to go till eight. So we have 20 more minutes and I expect we may go a little over that, but I wanna keep it as tight as possible. Cause I think we need to, um, you know, do the reflecting and all the information is gonna be need to be gathered um, as we move forward. Secretary Treasurer, is that accurate for the plan this evening? Mm -hmm. Are there any other process questions? Seeing none, I'll, uh, Trustee Rob Painter, were you going to ask a question or, or shall I go to Ryan Painter who is next on the list? I do have a process question. Okay, Trustee Whitaker. So I just note that um, the Secretary Treasurer has asked everyone to send emails to budget at SD61. Uh, currently, we're as trustees are receiving the feedback through trustees at SD61. So I would like to know when and how are trustees going to review everything at budget at? Because currently now I can keep up to it to, as it's coming in by the minute, literally. Um, but I'm concerned about getting one large package at one time. Secretary Treasurer? Well, I can never find myself. I'm not muted. Good, right? Um, We'll pass those along every day, Trustee Whitaker. Uh, what we're finding, and I'm sure you're the same, uh, so staff here at the board office who are under trustees uh, distribution list, um, uh, we receive all of those too. And so where we have ministry emails or principal emails or other emails interspersed uh, with the 300 music emails that come in a day, that's difficult to pick out uh, where the actual work is and not the feedback, uh, which we'll save up for another time. But uh, we will make sure that every uh, email that comes to um, budget at SD61 is sent out to you on a daily basis. Thank you, Secretary Treasurer. I appreciate that because it's just, it is really a lot to come yeah. to after a couple of days. And, I, and totally. again, I agree with you what's happening in the email. So if I've missed anybody's email, you know why. Yeah. So uh, budget at sd61.bc.ca is also going to help us build our FAQ, our budget FAQ page, which we've done uh, the last few years. So that's where people we want would like people to send their questions so that we can make sure that we're answering them and, and providing all the, the new required information. 
Um, so questions from Trustee Ryan Painter, then I've got Trustee McNally and Duncan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've, I've, first off, I've, I've all thanks and appreciation to the Secretary Treasurer and staff for putting that presentation together. Um, obviously, I have a lot of questions, but I, I guess I, just for my own edification as a newer trustee, um, what I would appreciate would maybe be a little bit of background on um, how it is that music operates. Um, in, I believe the way it was termed was outside the timetable um, and um, how they're able to get district funding uh, funding for that. And then I think the example was things like sports um, and art and, and those, um, you know, quote unquote, volunteer pieces are done within the timetable. Um, for me, it would help be helpful to understand a bit of the history about that. Um, so I'm wondering if you, if through you, uh, second, um, Chair, if the Secretary Treasurer could perhaps provide some background for me for that. Sure. Um, I can, or I'm just looking to the superintendent to see if she'd like to assign this one or if uh, she'd like me to speak to it. I think you can go ahead and then if uh, Colin or the team want to follow up, they can. Sure. And remember that um, certainly we'll take a more in-depth response to some of these pieces and, and expand them for you a little bit in your um, sessions so that they are a little clearer, but we'll give you the Reader's Digest today. So I'm going to focus on middle school because I think that's uh, where the, the question is. And so hopefully we understand how funding is provided to the school district. So secondary is per course. If you have more than eight courses, you'll be funded for more than one FTE. Middle and elementary is by headcount. One student is uh, one FTE funding, uh, no matter how many activities or courses they're taking. And so in the middle school rotation, uh, there are what we call exploratories. And they are um, things like art, uh, tech ed, uh, things like that. And so uh, they are built into the middle school timetable with the staffing um, that is provided by the district to the middle school principal and the middle school principal um, makes some decisions about what to staff. So shops, uh, art, uh, music, uh, if it's not uh, part of this wrap up. Um, and so what happens in school district 61 currently with this extra $1.5 million or this injection of teacher staffing into music, choir and strings in school district 61 and especially at middle is that these opportunities are offered before school uh, at lunchtime and after school and sometimes throughout the rotation. Um, but uh, they are supplemented by those nine to 11 teachers uh, for which we receive no funding. And so therein lies the rub in terms of uh, the investment we make in music at middle and uh, whether that aligns to our strategic plan or hits uh, the priorities that we have. And so, um, Without uh, that teacher staffing, um, nine to 11 teachers, uh, the band would have to run within the timetable with no extra staffing, similar to an exploratory or some of the other alternative methods I mentioned. Okay, I've got Trustee McNally and then Trustee Duncan and Ms. Waldron and Trustee Ferris on my list. Thank you, Chair. I probably do have 18 questions, but I won't ask them. Um, I have uh, two for tonight and I'll save the rest for other times. Uh, I On one of the slides, our Secretary Treasurer um, indicated that the gifted staffing uh, tasks would be taken up by school-based teams. Um, as a former learning support teacher, my understanding of school-based teams is that it's the counselor, it's the principal, it's the learning support teacher, it's classroom teachers who bring uh, students with, with um, you know, issues of learning and behavior to um, try to address at the school level. So I'm not quite sure how that team could um, take on gifted I wonder if I could have some clarification on that. And then just one more very short question. Thank you, Trustee McNally. And so uh, when the team talked about this particular line item in the budget, it was um, uh, felt that, or known, that uh, gifted is one end of the inclusion um, uh, 
uh, range and our special needs students in terms of some of their uh, designations uh, and high needs around uh, some of those uh, funding models that are funded are uh, sort of the other end of the range. And so that inclusion truly means uh, the full range of learners and that the uh, existing staffing from uh, SBIL would attend to the full range of students in any school. And that, uh, you know, the redesigned curriculum contains all students learning uh, and gifted is not a funded uh, designation in the funding model. Thank, thank you. So um, gifted, programming will be attention to gifted students will fall onto the classroom teacher right that's no additional programming i'm assuming and the, I got that right. and the school team well the school team all okay. right contacts means staff right so my next question is uh i understand that um yeah one of the slides spoke to uh a cut of the uh, reading recovery district coordinator um but then there was some statement about how money would still flow to the school. Um, as you know, I've stated with tiresome regularity, I taught reading recoveries for 10 years, so I know how it works. If you get rid of the reading recovery teacher leader, the district coordinator, the program will fall apart. It cannot exist without a teacher leader. So what we're doing here is completely um, disbanding reading recovery and you referred to a trademark because it is it has specific structures as we know that are tailored to each student but without a, a district coordinator reading recovery in this district would be gone have i got that right the uh, district portion so reading recovery is staffed uh, using two components in the school district uh, one is an allocation uh, <coughs> from district to the school traditionally uh, uh, this year and previous years. And the school can take staffing out of its uh, staffing packup at the principal's discretion to match that FTE. So the school contributes and the district contributes. Um, the school <clears throat> portion remains at the principal's discretion to use how they will. And the district portion has been reallocated to other teachers in the system, uh, but not reduced. Thank and you. So, um, what we do want to uh, make sure there's a offsetting there is that reading recovery can attend to approximately eight uh, students per school or given in any given time. And what we tried to look at in this budget is um, what were the impacts for all or the greatest number of students or the greatest good. And so uh, through that $500,000 literacy investment, uh, we are going to be trying to meet schools where they are and advancing their literacy programs from there. So I just want to thank you for that, Secretary Treasurer. I'll just state finally that reading recovery will be gone. If that's not true, I'd like somebody to say that's not true. Thank you. Uh, I will go to Trustee Duncan. And then I've got um, Ms. Waldron, Trustee Ferris, and Trustee Rob Painter, and Ms. Massey. And I will, uh, everybody will get a chance to, oh, get their question out so you don't need to hold your hand up. I know it's painful. Tracy Duncan. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, and I have uh, also many, many questions uh, about the proposal that we received on Friday. I think tonight I wanna just focus on what I see as sort of um, two areas that I wanna have a greater understanding and, and would ask for some more details, um, but appreciate that tonight that won't be likely possible. Uh, but I, I wondered. I wanted to explore the the issue of the structural deficit. Uh, we in this district have had a structural deficit for many many years, um, and as has been presented, we've we've always balanced that our budgets by allocating surplus from the current school year to cover that structural deficit. Um, but I, you know, given what we're proposing, I would really appreciate looking more specifically at the source of the structural deficit. Um, so if we could pr produce some kind of a detailed um, table, uh, I'm sure it already exists, which itemizes that structural deficit so that we can really appreciate um, where it comes from, what items are indeed items that um, if we don't make adjustments, we will incur year on year, um, and what are legacy issues. So one-time uh, issues that caused a deficit in particular areas but are not 
um, sources of debt that will continue year on year. I would certainly very much appreciate that. And then in addition, I've so far heard uh, quite a lot of discussion about the federal and provincial COVID funding that we received uh, this year. I understand from the Secretary of Treasurer's comments tonight that the intention was for that to be one-time funding. And so I assume by that statement that we, we um, ha can't look to the federal provincial governments to support us as COVID continues. Um, and so with that, it brings me back to, again, an examination of where we've been over the last year from a budget perspective. And I'm wondering if we could get some further information about uh, where we saw shortfalls. So um, if we could explain the source of any COVID related shortfalls during 2020, 2021, uh, that would certainly um, help me to have a better foundational understanding of where we, where we are. Um, and I think I'll leave because of the shortage of time tonight, uh, my questions about the specifics of the proposal for another night, but thank you. Okay, there's quite a bit there, Secretary Treasurer. I have written that down and we can provide some further detail on that as uh, Trustee Duncan's requested. Okay, Ms. Waldron. Thank you, Chair. And since I've been asked what my position is here at this meeting, um, I'm here representing the Greater Victoria Teachers Association as the president. Um, I have quite a few questions. So I think I'll just start at the top and you can go to the next person then maybe come back to me if that's appropriate, Chair. On uh, page 20, you refer to, uh, which is about the district team and told me, and there's a cut in collaboration time of over 500,000. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding of this time is that it enables classroom teachers and non-enrolling teachers to work together to plan for co-teaching and develop inclusive practices to be able to share ideas and knowledge and plan together. Um, sort of the, the practical on the ground support that helps teachers realize that the one learning community slogan without being able to meet, we can't do that work. So I'm wondering how you plan to um, have that work continue or is the intent that we will no longer have any collaboration time for our members? Secretary Treasurer or Superintendent? So this line item does contemplate the removal of that collaboration time um, as to what it would be replaced with or how we can attend to that uh, would be within the principal's um, uh, existing staffing or staffing pack up uh, and through the learning team and some of those reinvestment initiatives. Um, I think that uh, the focus will be on alignment to the strategic plan. Uh, so I'm not sure uh, if I can answer your question in terms of collaboration time. Uh, I'm not sure if the superintendent or the deputy um, can speak to that, but it's definitely not in draft three. And we all are just as clear as you are how critically important that is. Um, expect to see some very good feedback in that survey about priorities when um, we look at monies that hopefully will come back to us, um, increased enrollment and uh, ISP getting back to normal as one of the priorities of one of the first things we would absolutely be considering putting back because you're right, that's a critical element. And so even though we might have to view it at this point, um, those kind of turnaround things, things are going to be just as important as hopefully we shift into a much more positive financial climate. Thank you, Chair. Can I ask a second question now? Or would yes, you no, please go ahead. Um, I just. I want to make sure everybody gets a chance. Uh, For sure. And certainly not everybody, we're not going to get to every question tonight. And that's why we've got many more nights of, of opportunities. But please go ahead. Uh, on page 23, it refers to education assistance staffing. And there's a reduction in 685, I guess, 686,000. Um, I think... Uh, that represents about 16 EAs. One of the emails I get constantly is, as the president of the GBTA is, um, uh, there's not enough support in our classes. And we heard from Pete Langstrat when we moved to this full inclusion model that it was gonna be a very expensive model, but this is like the number one concern. So I'm curious with this reduction, because it, it, it seems like it says staffing nil, and then um, 
I'm wondering where the district is suggesting that these EAs be cut from, but schools are going to not have support. And so um, every year we um, obviously are mandated to provide service to our unique students. Uh, this is definitely a reduction in those EA hours. Again, no question about that. Um, we do know that uh, historically we've spent uh, more um, on our unique student needs in the areas of level one, two, three uh, students and others uh, beyond the level one, two, three funding that we receive and that we spend up to uh, eight to 10% more out of the block uh, than we do of the uh, funded amounts. Uh, we're still uh, with this current proposal, we're still um, spending more out of the block uh, than uh, our level one, two, three funding. So we are investing more than we're funded for. Um, but uh, this would be uh, across the board in terms of student need and where uh, some additional supports would not be issued at this time. And I think this is another area of focus. Uh, if enrollment were to increase, uh, this is definitely something we would look at. The main message here is that uh, unique student needs in terms of level one, two, three needs and some of those uh, behavior supports uh, will be attended to through our uh, budget, no matter what the funding will be. Thank you, Secretary Treasurer. Chair, would you like me to ask a third? <laughs> We're gonna, I'm gonna move on up the list. Thank you That's though. Fair. Can you put me back on the list? Trustee Ferris? Oh, uh, thank you. I'll try to be uh, quick here. Um, uh, just in listening to what everybody's saying, I'm thinking that, uh, I mean, I've always felt that uh, music and the arts should be a uh, part of the core cu curriculum in, in, in British Columbia. And uh, I'm hoping that all these people who are writing to us will uh, also be writing to uh, the minister because I think that's pretty essential. Uh, I, I was just uh, reflecting on the fact that back in the year 2000, uh, we toured uh, numerous middle schools in British Columbia. And, and one of the things that we were thinking uh, in, in making that transition to middle schools was that uh, exploratories and prep time in a larger cohort of students would allow us to offer music uh, in, a, you know, in a way that it hadn't been offered before. Now, I know that that particular model is just a shadow of what's happening in schools like Cindy's, but uh, nonetheless, I, I would sort of like to get some idea uh, from principals, not tonight, but at some point, uh, about how we might be able to introduce grade six students to music. Because I think when we don't get them at the grade six level, uh, it's pretty hard to retain their interest. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Ferris. Um, we'll go to Ms. Massey, QP947. Thank you, thank you. Um, if I could, I just wanted a little bit of clarity going back to the EA piece um, and the reduction of the almost $700,000. I thought I heard you say that you alluded that was partly because of the 2% increase that they would be getting. And it was my understanding that um, through our PFA that our wage increases were fully funded. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is an area I think that also needs more exploration. exploration. Uh, so we know that um, our operating grant this year increased by 6 million. Uh, we know that last year we received a separate funding line item called labor settlement funding in the first year of the collective agreement for five, approximately $5 million. Uh, and so the increase in the per pupil amounts, so I'll go back, sorry. So in 2021, we received a separate line item of about $5 million for um, um, labor settlement funding intended to fund the increases in the collective agreement, which it did. Uh, now we go to 21-22, where we receive uh, the collective agreement increases in the per pupil amount. So usually in the second year of the collective agreement, the ministry will roll up the labor settlement funding into the block. And it's always a bit of uh, consternation and calculating to try to determine if uh, the collective agreement is fully funded. And so we would say in this case, we suspect that we may be uh, short by about $700,000 in that area. Um, 
And so that is something we are uh, continuing to explore with our provincial association. Um, but uh, that would be a major difference in the revenue. Uh, that one line item this year of 5 million and our operating grant increasing by 6 million intended to uh, cover years one and two of the collective agreement. And you can see receiving 5 million in one year and 6 million in the next uh, to cover two years isn't quite a match. Uh, and so that's a big uh, part of um, where we see a discrepancy. So it is, the ministry does intend to fully fund collective agreements, but in my experience in the second year of the collective agreement, when we roll up from that labor settlement line item into the block, there's always a discrepancy. So that's something we need to um, identify and look at further. Well, I certainly hope you find it because it's only going to have a devastating effect. We know what a um, an issue recruitment and retention is. Um, if you're doing with less EAs, you're going to see more behaviors in the students. You're going to see more EAs sick. You're going to have not 40 and 50 EAs short a day. You're going to have way more because everyone's going to run from this profession. And then you're going to have other people running. So um, anyways, I'll obviously more to that later. And my second question um, Really disappointed because I know that we had uh, a group of clerical staff, uh, SAA3s had discussions with um, some of the senior management last year around providing equity in clerical to our schools because it's all over the map. And, um, you know, I've already heard from people who've been told they're going to, they're probably getting laid off. And it's, it's not school assistants that might do supervision. It's, it's the people that support the SAA3s in the schools doing attendance, doing, you know, all manner of work, you know, supervision is its own um, budget. So school assistants shouldn't be doing supervision. And if we're cutting positions at the board that only offloads down to the schools. And again, our, most of our clerical work overtime and they're just gonna end up more, working more overtime. And, you know, it's, it's uh, gonna be devastating again for them. So anyways, we'll have more on that. It's just my two statements for tonight. Hey, thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. Um, um, next on the list I'm keeping here is Ms. Hammer from BC PAC. BC PAC Chair. Thank you. BC PAC would like to request some changes to your consultation plan. Despite being shown on your website as an official partner, we note that VC PACs and PACs in general are not specifically included in the consultation plan. Being reduced as PACs and parents to emails and the thought exchange survey is disrespectful given the magnitude of the impact on families in the district from these cuts. We see, unfortunately, this oversight as continuing a pattern of disregard and devaluing of parent and PAC voices. The proposed cuts to music programs at middle schools and elementary schools with strings programs will fundamentally change the very fabric and culture of the affected schools and consultations with each school PAC that wishes it should be provided. We would like each PAC to be able to ask questions and have them answered at such an event which ability isn't right now built in the existing proposed consultation process. Can I speak to that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I, I can see perhaps in the presentation um, that uh, it was not clear. When I think about partners, I do think about BCPAC. And so uh, the intent to invite you to presentation times at both the May 10th in camera and the uh, May 17th uh, meetings are definitely open. And so I'll make sure that we are um, communicating that clearly um, mm -hmm. and I'll let the board speak to the per pack, but uh, we definitely want to treat VC pack like we would GBTA or QP and give you those opportunities with trustees to express your uh, impressions and uh, to relay your considerations and concerns and ideas about the budget. And so if that was a miscommunication on my part, I do apologize. And I just, I do urge the board to build in, like in the boundary process, you built in um, some very well attended last minute specific targeted consultations with the affected schools. And when I think about the enormity of these changes for middle schools, especially, I just think you need to provide parents with an opportunity to ask questions and have them answered just, just like you're, you're, you're doing now. And so I would just urge you as trustees to, to, to make that happen. 
Thank you. Okay, I'm ready to move on to our motions to rescind, noting the time. Um, Trustee Whitaker, did you have a question? Yeah, if I can, just because I didn't ask a question, but I would follow up from what uh, uh, President Hammer said. Um, and I'm curious if uh, you know, through you to the secretary treasurer, what are we doing at the school level for PACs? Are we encouraging administrators to have these open conversations with their PAC or at least to share that information and avenues to, to, to bring any input from the PAC to the board? Are we, are we following some sort of process there to include them beyond the DPAC? Treasurer? Uh, yes, I leave the um, consultation with PAC and staff to the principal. Uh, so that is something we can mention. Um, and we definitely don't want to overstep on the uh, district BC PAC side. So uh, our conduit would be BC PAC. Uh, can certainly ask um, principals to reach out to their PACs as they do their staff. Uh, but uh, that's the relationship they have. And I, I think uh, PACs will be uh, reaching out to them for that conversation as well. So um, hopefully uh, Crystal can uh, gather some of that feedback for us uh, through the partner table. Maybe if we, if we just remind yeah. our administrators of that button. And uh, I've got trustee Rob Painter, I've got you on the list. Um, also, if uh, Ms. Hammer, if VC PAC requires support for engaging with the PACs, please let us know if we can support that as well. Um, we'll just want to make sure we're going on all fields. Trustee Rob Painter, and then we, we need to move on and we'll continue all the questions uh, um, and comments soon. Um, I'm not able to hear Trusty Painter. I see Diane's indicating she can't either. Take your headset off. Well, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, apparently my headset was dead. Uh, so uh, yeah, as part of my uh, as part of my annual uh, budget thing, I'll be putting in a freedom of information request for the line item budget again. But that really speaks to what I'm at, what I'm interested in here is that uh, it, it would appear that we have uh, a significant increase in expenses this year over uh, what we would normally see. Uh, I understand some of that might be related to uh, the roll up of uh, uh, you know labor settlement agreements, et cetera, into the per student funding. But uh, uh, when I look at, uh, I wish I had the page number, the slide that talks about draft three balanced and talks about revenue and expenses uh, with wage increases and staffing levels of 6.9 million uh, contractual or other of 1.9 million. Th those question, those really jump out at me as big ticket items that I would really like to understand better. What what did we spend money on this year? And why, given that that in effect, we've been moving our our deficit financing forward every year by, you know, allocating money at the start of the year from the previous year, and then somehow saving up enough money to move it again forward to the next year. I, I was curious how we went from uh, seven million dollars, generally speaking, uh, the past few years, to three and a half this year. And where did that expend expenditure go during the current year? That's what I'm really curious about now: is how we set ourselves up this year so that we can understand moving forward what the impacts are. Sure, we can do that analysis for you, Rob. Okay, hey, thank you everyone for your thoughtful questions. Um, our first motion to rescind is from September 2016. 
which is, so the motion is that the board rescind the unspent $242,137 of the $500,000 commitment in the following motion that was carried at the September 26, 2016 regular Board of Education meeting, which is that the board approved 500,000 of the June 30th, 2016 unrestricted operating surplus Four million six hundred forty-one thousand five hundred ninety-three. No e to provide learning resources to support the new curriculum. Can I have um, a mover under. and a seconder? Thank you, Trustee Ferris. Is there any debate on this motion, Trustee Painter? Sorry, I'm gonna have to learn a whole new unmute process. Uh, I, I would really appreciate. Uh, some background on uh, where where this was the expenditures occurred, and uh, I'm actually kind of surprised, given how uh, clever our our staff is at the school level in particular about finding ways to spend money. I mean that in a very positive way, not pejorative at all. Uh, why, if we offered up five hundred thousand, that two hundred forty two was left on the table? Secretary Treasurer? Yeah, I think um, this is a, um, a district initiative that carried forward from year to year, um, just perhaps given the time and priority of uh, the staff that was uh, responsible for it. Um, my understanding is uh, it sits at a district level and not in the schools, and therefore that may be why it's unspent, although we know uh, lots of our schools carry forward their maximum 80 and 40 as well, but this is a district carry forward. Uh, that clearly can be used or reallocated to balance surplus rather than uh, to continue to be carried forward as unspent. Okay, thank you so much, Trustee Whitaker. Thank you, and thank you for finding these little pockets of money. Uh, I just, I'm just seeking that actual clarification that none of these are. I mean, I say it's. I see that it says that it came from unrestricted money, but for after it was unrestricted, was it restricted? So, is there any internal restrictions on these, or so clear, um, clear to go? Sorry, yeah, they're clear to go from year to year uh, on your financial statements. This carry forward would have been reflected in department carry forwards in your note to your financial statement. Yeah, can you find some more of those two, please? <laughs> Thank you. They're looking. Okay, I'll call the question. All those in favor of the motion on the floor? All those opposed? Trustee McNally and Trustee Painter are opposed. The motion carries. And now we'll move to the September 2017 library support. So we're doing the same thing again. We're being asked to rescind the unspent 31,980 of the $100,000 commitment to the following motion that was carried September 25th, 2017, which is that the board approve 100,000, the unrestricted operating surplus of 3,774,594 to provide district-wide library support. Um, may I have a mover and a seconder. Thank you, Trustee Leonard. I get a second, Trustee Ferris. Discussion on the motion. I imagine similar questions, perhaps. Trustee Whitaker? Yeah, I would just make the comment that if the Secretary Treasurer wanted to find some internally restricted funds, I'd be good with that too. Okay, seeing no speakers to the motion, I'll call the question. All those in favor? All those opposed? Abstentions? Trustee Duncan, can you indicate for me verbally how you voted? Sure, yeah, I was in favor. Okay, thank you so much. I think you maybe glitched on my end. So that motion carries with Trustee Painter and McNally opposed and, and the rest in favor. So now we're moving to the recommended motion. And so again, just to be clear, we passed the first reading and the amounts are going to change as we move forward. Um, we passed the first reading of the annual budget bylaw March 29th. And now today we're going to lay this on the floor, but we're not going to vote on it until May 17th, 2021. So before we put it on the floor, uh, I will give our partners an opportunity to speak. 
Uh, Ms. Waldron. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the extent of cuts is shocking and profoundly upsetting to the whole community, as you've been hearing. I think you've been inundated. Um, even with notice and time to process and advocate, this would have been difficult. But these proposals were only sent Friday. And then, despite um, all of the insistence you've heard tonight that these are simple proposals are uh, shown to provide clarity about spending, the cuts you're showing tonight were already included in staffing packages. Our staff has already been told they're being cut in excess to needs. Staff have been told their positions and programs have been cut. Teachers have been told they are now excess to school needs and district needs and those staffing processes are underway. Should the board make decisions to reverse these proposals, the staffing can be replaced and we can figure out how to recall those teachers, their assignments, but the implications of this timing has been devastating and done serious damage to the GVTAs and our members trust in their employer. As trustees of the system, you need to seriously consider the harm that has been done here and how your actions in the next six weeks will impact staff, students and families. We have poured over these documents in the last four days and there are many unanswered questions about why this crisis has occurred. Uh, is this a case of mismanagement in the previous year's budgets? Are these radical cuts the price of a change in accounting practices? If we have always, always ended up with a surplus, what has changed that indicate that revenues won't return to post-COVID numbers? Are these funds and money that could be realistically be considered for reductions that haven't been made apparent yet? And I do think you're considering some of those options. There have been rumblings about a deficit for months now. Why have these cuts been sprung on everyone under a time frame that clearly limits the trustees' ability to make good decisions? This series of events is distressing. And in addition to making decisions about the budget, the trustees need to look at what happened to create this mess. The majority of these cuts directly impact students, whether it's providing music education for families that might not otherwise be able to afford them or dozens of educational assistants who work directly with students, youth and family uh, school counselors, reading recovery, food programs for hungry kids and programming for gifted students. The list goes on and on and it's appalling. It's worth saying out loud that all of these staffing cuts, only 2.6 FTE comes from administration and mostly a reduction in VP time, which will further impact teachers. And notably, none of that impacts senior administration. It's gross. If the trustees around this table share the community's concern about what this budget represents, you have hard work ahead of you. There is more that should unite you than divide you right now. And you will need to work together in order to effectively demonstrate your committed support to students and staff in this district. We appreciate that there will be opportunities for stakeholder and public input, and we look forward to being meaningfully, meaningfully involved and intend to provide more detailed feedback. We hope that you will hear all of that feedback you receive and that we see significant changes in this budget. Thank you, Chair. Would any other of our partners like to speak to the budget bylaw? This is not, there will be lots of opportunities to share your perspective and, and at the final debate. So seeing none, could I have a mover and a seconder? Sorry, Chair, one, President Hammer. My hands up. Oh, My hands up. Sorry. Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> ah, I live in fear. <laughs> um, oh, don't worry, We're, I'm very reasonable and trying to go as slow as I can to catch everybody. So as you know, thank you for the opportunity to speak. And as you know, BC PAC um, is our purpose under the School Act is to advise you on matters relating to public education in our district. Our advice to you based on feedback from our membership is that the budget cuts proposed are completely at odds with the wishes of your community. According um, to the chair and statements to CBC, the deficit is partly due from the lost international student revenues during the pandemic and partly because the district is changing its approach to budgeting. It seems incomprehensible to parents that you as a board would compound the damage from the loss of tuition revenue in a pandemic by forcing through a seemingly voluntary change in your budgeting process. Furthermore, it's so hard to reconcile and it seems very unkind and almost cruel um, to, 
to reconcile the loss of these services and programs at this time, given how much our students and family have lost as a result of the pandemic. As parents, we do not understand how coming out of more than a year of social isolation, at home, individualized learning, delayed learning and loss learning, you can cut the very tools in your toolbox best suited to repair the damage to kids resulting from the pandemic. For example, music education, band and strings and choir is collective learning, and it's so fundamentally and ideally suited to rebuild and strengthen social and emotional and community connectivity after a year of social isolation. You know, what is better for kids right now than a class of grade six learning to play Ode to Joy in time? Our advice to you is that the decision to push forward with an unnecessary change to your budgeting framework at this time is just unacceptable and completely out of touch with the wishes of the community that you represent. So thank you, we look forward to being consulted. We look forward to parents being given an opportunity to speak and to ask questions and hopefully change your mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Hammer, making sure I'm not missing anyone. Uh, thank you, Trustee Leonard. Are you moving the laying motion? Before? I'm putting the bylaw on the floor, please. May I have a seconder? Thank you, Trustee Ryan Painter. So there it shall lay until the 17th. And as noted, there's going to be lots of opportunity for engagement. As we move on, we've extended our regular budget process by a month. Um, all questions that were asked tonight and those that come in through the website, the budget at sd61.bc.ca will go up on a FAQ page. So please um, keep up to date on that. And if you do submit a question or ask one here tonight, uh, make sure that you're looking for it there. It's the uh, amount of um, email incoming is, is pretty overwhelming. So uh, this is gonna really help us streamline and make sure that we get as many, all the answers out as, as we can. Are we gonna uh, have a so vote, Chair? On what? The bylaw motion. No, Trustee McNally, as I said, it is being laid on the floor until May 17th. So no vote will happen. Our next motion here tonight is to adjourn the meeting. Why would you even do that? Do you need some support around understanding the process? No, I just or want to, uh, no. It's ridiculous to lay a motion on the floor and not have a vote. Secretary Treasurer? Uh, the purpose of laying the motion on the floor is to leave the board a consultation uh, um, period of time in which it can gather information in order to debate and vote in a few weeks time uh, to uh, contemplate the considerations in this budget or to change them. Thank you. Well, I plan to do everything I can to stop it in its tracks. Okay, thank you, Trustee McNally. We're not debating this evening as been stated multiple times. Trustee Rob Painter, did you have a question before I call for a motion to adjourn? Uh, yes, I have new business. Okay, well, if it's a, sorry, it's a special. It's a special board meeting, so we don't have any extra motions under new business. You can submit well, it for the board meeting, which is just around the corner. Excuse me, but why would there why would there be a space in our agenda for new business and notice of motions if we're not going to entertain new business and most notice of, of motions? So our um, agendas are set in our bylaw. And they always look the same, regardless of whether there's things under any of the headings. But if you look at special meetings under Robert's Rules of Order, and I know we've been through this before, that you don't add business to the agenda that hasn't been circulated, because it's not fair to everybody who didn't have a chance to speak to it, consider it. And so um, I'm noting that we are two weeks away from our board meeting. Um, that's where where, where it goes. If you'd like me to take time to find the, the oh. Robert's rule citation, I'm happy to recess and do that. Oh. But unfortunately, we're at the end of our agenda. It's 826. We've gone 26 minutes over. And so this isn't the time for, for new business. Uh, may I ask 
Okay, I, I accept your ruling in that regard. Uh, notice of motions, would that be appropriate given that it isn't content that will be addressed tonight? It's simply a notification? Sure, you can provide a notice of motion to the next board meeting if that's what you'd like to do. Uh, if I may then, uh, that uh, I, I will be, uh, just as a notice of motion, that I will be introducing a motion to uh, suspend the current uh, budget proposal, uh, revert to a rollover budget model with existing uh, department and school level budgets as per the current year, recognizing uh, populations student populations uh yeah so that's what i'm going to be doing at the board meeting okay trustee painter my understanding and we can certainly take some time to look at this is that you're going to need to defeat the bylaw before you're going to be able to because it's on the floor now we're consulting on that so we're not going to be able to suspend that process without dealing with the motion that has been laid on the table for May 17th. So I'm happy to discuss the process with you and look at alternatives for you bringing forward um, the direction you want to, but that that would be just my fair warning in terms of putting our, our, our uh, agendas together. So okay, another, I'd like a motion to adjourn. It is another motion, notice of motion. I will bring that motion to defeat the current bylaw. Motion to adjourn. Thank you, Trustee Peter. Second. All those in favor. Thank you. We got to work within our existing processes, I'm afraid. I understand it's challenging. Thanks, everybody. And I look forward to future conversations, even though they may be difficult. Bye for now. <laughs>